life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. We began talking about have this mind in you this morning. And as we went to lunch, we uh, went to a Chinese food restaurant and enjoyed the various delicacies therein. And at the end of the meal, they brought out the fortune cookies and they threw them out on the table and there was extra ones. I did not see what was in the extra ones because somebody who will remain nameless, Janice, <laughs> stole them all. But she said, well, Bruce, you ought to open these up while you're preaching and then incorporate them into your lesson. Well, I'm not going to do that, but I did bring the one that was in mine. I do not put any stock in fortune cookies. But this one was kind of interesting. A change of perspective will bring you the answer you seek. And that's kind of what we talked about this morning. That by changing the perspective of our life, by getting a different attitude in life, it's going to change everything about us and get us what we're seeking. And what we're seeking is to draw closer to God, to draw closer and to have a more intimate relationship, to have the mind of Christ, which is a mind wherein he was willing to set aside privilege, willing to sacrifice for us, and to totally involve himself in abject humility. And then that's the mind that he had and possessed as he walked on the face of the earth. We realize that we're dualistic, that we have a soul and we have a spirit. We're the highest of God's creation, which is something we're going to talk about next week. Next uh, Lord's Day, we're going to talk about why God created man. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we also realize that we have to change our attitude. We have to change our mindset. We need an attitude adjustment. All of this we talked about this morning so that we might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And where we left it was we've got to kill any negative thought. Kill the ants because we are overtaken with negativity. And uh, so build this back to where we want to be this afternoon and use it as a transition. Go back to the book of Philippians. And let's go into the fourth chapter. And look down about verse 8. And if you think of this chapter, think of, of excellence. And that's what he wants the Philippians to do, to be mindful of excellence. Now, it's, it's truly striking because at the time Paul writes this, as most well know, he's under house arrest in Rome. And he talks about joy and rejoicing throughout this book. And then in verse 8, he brings out finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. So yeah, you've got to kill the negativity. The negativity that rises up in each and every one of us. Because attitude is contagious. And if we're always in a kind of a dour mood, that's going to rub off on anyone we come in contact with. And so we struggle. We don't want to be dour, but we want to exude a sense of positivity, of excellence. That is the mind of Christ. And that's what we want to embrace. But now let's build a little bit further. In Colossians, the third chapter, in verse 10, Paul challenges them to put on love. You put on Christ, now put on love. 
How do you put on love? Just now, as we were coming back from the restaurant, I was getting ready to get in the car, took my jacket and began putting it on. <laughs> and I even remarked, I look like a special needs person, not defaming special needs, because people do have special needs. But for whatever reason, it was a challenge to put my jacket on. And I'm going, what's wrong with me mentally? I was saying that in my brain. But you know, sometimes spiritually, what's wrong with me? Because it is a chore, it is a challenge to be able to put on the new man and to put on love. So look what Paul says. Paul said, do not lie to one another in verse 9. But then in 10 he says, have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the one who created him. And drop down into 12. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So that's what I got to put on. I've got to be able to put on compassion, kindness, humility, Gentleness, patience, forgiveness. So I look at those, and I'm going, okay, which one's the hardest? What's the most challenging for me to do? And the answer comes back with regards to me. Patience. I am very impatient with people, and I need to be better at it. I need to do better at my level of patience. Because that comes back to the realm of understanding. And I need to understand people. So that's my challenge. So what's your challenge? Which one of those? Gentleness? I'm, I'm gentle. I'm the kind one. I tell that to Linda all the time. Well, I'm the kind one. And she's gotten even to parrot that as well. I figure if I say it enough, it's bound to be true. But one are you, which one? Or maybe which ones are you challenged by? And I think it would be fair to say, in all honesty, I said patience. But in all honesty, I think they're all, they're all a challenge for me. Because they go contrary to what I really want to do. But if I have the mind of Christ, they get to be easier. To have the compassion and the kindness. If I have the humility then that means I'm willing to serve. So with that humility, I'm gentle and I'm forgiving. And yes, I'm patient. And I realize patience because others were patient with me and have exhibited that patience. And how dare I not be patient with others? So we can have the mind of Christ and this is part of it. Now look down at verse 14, because in verse 14, and beyond all these things, put on love. Why? Because it's the perfect bond of unity. So the real, the real attitude that Christ exhibited was one of love. And love has the tentacles that go out all sorts of different ways. And in order for me to do that, and to join together with others, I've got to have love. I've got to tear down every barrier. I've got, to, I've got to remove them. And I've got to reach out. And that's hard for mankind to do. Because we have biases. Lose the bias. Lose the prejudice. And I'm not necessarily talking about those prejudices that are, you know, we think of them immediately as racial prejudice, or as gender bias. Those things should have long been forgotten. We should have grown past all those things. But what about the other biases that we have? The other prejudices. James talks about them. James talks about the rich having a bias of, of those that are rich. Oh, you give them more preferential treatment. Nuh-uh. 
They're people just like us. And when you think about ethnicity, we're all equal. I love, I love the picture of the different eggs that are shown. Brown egg, kind of a bluish egg, a white egg. What are they? They're just eggs. You crack them open, they're all the same. They're eggs. We're all people. We have the same wants, we have the same desires. We're people. We share the same, the same elements, the soul and the spirit. We have the same struggles. And so we look at these things and we put on love. Because what love does is love looks to the best interest of others. I have love for Austin and Haley. I want the best for them. Whatever that best is for them, that's what I want. Same way with young Greg. I like the way Greg leads singing. He gets up, no nonsense, 500. Give me the Bible. Immediately followed. All right, Bruce will speak. I love that. Because there is a love for Greg as a brother in Christ. We want the best for everyone. The best for Dolores. And I truly do want the best for Dolores. Because usually the best for Dolores means she's going to go to a new restaurant. She's going to come back and she's going to share about it. She comes back and, and rhapsodizes about it. Oh, they had the best. And then you see her hands going all over. And it's great. I enjoy watching her. I enjoy listening to her. And I enjoy her sharing. And if she doesn't like a restaurant, ain't no way I'm going there. I want the best for, for Dolores. Same way with Mary. Same way with everyone we come in contact with. Because that's the mind of Christ. And if necessary, to be willing to sacrifice for them. Because there's that love. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and we're not going to go there. We spent a lot of time there over the years. Love is gentle, love is kind, etc. The personification of what love truly is. Love never fails. Why? Because what we have done is we've embraced the mindset of Christ. And if we have that in place, we're going to constantly be looking for ways to set forth that love, that act of goodwill to another. Because what we're going to have done is we're going to have done is we've done what Paul has challenged us to look and employ the fruit of the Spirit and embrace the fruit of the Spirit. Employ the fruit of the Spirit. After he talked about the deeds of the flesh, which are evident, which are these. And then he goes through and begins to nail them. And he says earlier on there in Galatians 5, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then in Galatians 5, 22, now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. Why? Because the fruit of the Spirit is, in essence, the same thing as having the mind of Christ. And you stop and look at it. Because it's all there. It's love. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is about. Linda today showed me the dessert menu at the restaurant. And she said, oh, this would be great. And I said, good, let's order it. And then I called the guy over to order. And I looked over and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Which one are you pointing at? 
She goes, this wrapped banana stuff. And I go, no. We're getting the chocolate ball of chocolate, which we had, which was decadent, which Jason and Brittany took home the last of. But it was great. But it was not fruit. There was fruit on the plate. Who wants the fruit? Take it all. We want the fruit of the Spirit. Take it all. Take every bit of it. Because it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. So you can't just take part of it. You've got to take all of it. All of it. So what part are we challenged by? What part don't we like? I mean, by now you know that I got food issues, okay? I got a lot of them. No chicken, no bananas, uh, and I'm sure we could figure out some other things. No. But what I'm talking about here is spiritual. And we can't have any food issues here. And we look at the whole fruit of that which we look at, and there's these delicious segments, and each one more savory than the other. But together they blend into a cacophony of, of sweetness and palatability to us. But you can't say, I just want this one segment. No. You take it all. You enjoy it all. You savor it all. Because that's the mind of Christ. So have this mind in you. That yes, I'm going to employ the gentleness and the goodness. I'll bring those into my life. And I'll embrace it. I'll celebrate it. Because what I realize is that what that's talking about is the way that I have to exist in this world. We sing the song, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, Thou Lamb of Calvary. We understand it. We also understand that we look up to God at lunch again, we were talking about the plane that had to return back to Portland. It had gotten up to a certain altitude. An emergency door popped out. Fortunate that nobody was sitting in that seat next to it. They immediately had to descend. Ears began to pop and all sorts of issues. They were able to land safely. But I bet you the next time individuals get on a plane, they're going to pay attention to what the, the flight attendant says, at least those that were on that plane. Because there was somebody who had a cell phone and was taking a video of what happened. And you see people fumbling with the, the, the air masks, not able to put them on. Then figuring it out. But if you remember the flight attendants, on every flight I've ever been on, they say in the event of the cabin losing pressure, you do a couple things. You first look up, because you realize you're in trouble. You look up. You reach up. You pull the, the mask to you. You put the mask squarely on you. And then you look to help others. Look what the fruit of the Spirit does. The fruit of the Spirit looks up. It looks in. Then it looks out. It's exactly what the flight attendant said. When danger happens, and we realize that we live in a world where sin has taken over. 
We live in a world that is broken because of sin. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's danger. We look to God. We try to take care of self. And then we look to others. So, love, joy, and peace. They are applicable to self. We need those. We need those and those to be ours so that we can utilize them elsewhere. Faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Those look upward toward God. And then, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, they look outward. Inward, outward, upward. Upward, inward, outward. However you want to put the dynamic. It begins to factor in the totality of life and what we're called upon to do. And, and it's beautiful. As beautiful as, as any flower that God had created when you see it being employed by an individual. This morning as we drove in, we were driving down from our house, down Overman, a little cul-de-sac, and as we were driving off to the right, there's a house that has the most beautiful birds of paradise that are in full bloom. Magnificent oranges, blues, yellows, reds. They take your breath away. Last night, if you looked at the sunset, it was, it was a blending together of the most beautiful, beautiful colors that you could ever see. And you stood in marble. I was there in, in the family room. And there was something on the television. Couldn't tell you what. And Linda said, what are you looking at? And I said, look outside. Look at the beauty of that sunset. And it changed colors several times over. It was magnificent. The beauty of God's creation. Well, when we have the mind of Christ and we reflect it in our life, it is a manifestation of the beauty of God's creation. And that's seen in us. On Saturday the 20th, we're going to be gathering together singing songs of praise, involving ourselves in prayers, and hearing three short talks, all designed to center around, let the beauty of Jesus be seen. And as we go forward this year, from time to time, the lessons are going to come back to let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Where? Where? In me. In me. In what I do. How I interact with others. My reaching out and so on and so forth. Any number of different ways that the beauty of Jesus can be seen. Because just as those flowers are, to me, are so amazing. So it is when I see a child of God who is employing the mind of Christ in all that they do and all that they're about. They look upward to God, realizing I've got to take care of me. They deal with inward to me and then outward to others. It's beautiful. A masterful painting. Go back into the book of James. And in James... James talks about the wisdom from above. Go into the third chapter. Because that's kind of what we're talking about. The wisdom from above. So look at what he says. James 3, 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Valid question. Who here is wise and understanding? 
I do not think of myself as wise. I would like to think that I'm understanding. But just because I hold some papers that indicated I went to school does not mean I'm wise. Does not mean that I'm smart. Doesn't mean anything other than I went to school and got some papers. That's all it means. But James asked the question, who is wise and understanding? And he's going to lay it out for us. And he's going to lay it out clearly, simply. One would say succinctly with regards to it. So watch as he goes on. Um, let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of wisdom. It is my behavior that manifests itself as to whether or not I am wise, whether or not I am understanding, whether or not I have the mind of Christ. So watch the wisdom that he talks about. He talks about bitter jealousy in 14 and selfish ambition. Let's not touch that. Let's not touch 15. Let's not touch 16. Because he's talking about negativity. And I'm not saying gloss over sin. It's not what I'm saying. But let's focus on the positive. 17. The wisdom from above is first pure. Let's talk about purity. Purity. I dropped a cloth napkin on the floor at the restaurant. And I go, oh, I better get my napkin. Linda said, no, 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 no. It's been on the floor. Okay, it's a napkin. She said, get one over there. All righty. Purity. That's all she was saying. You don't want to wipe your dirty mouth with a dirty napkin. It's been on the floor. Makes sense. Purity. We want that which is pure. Well, what is purer than God's word? Nothing. It is 100% pure. You can go to it, you can study it, and it is pure. Ivory soap touted itself as being, I forget, 99 point something something pure. Really close, but not 100% pure. God's word's 100% pure. The wisdom from above is first pure. The wisdom we're talking about is the wisdom that's found in God's word. The writer of Proverbs in the first six chapters talks about wisdom. Wisdom coming from God. Larry Haverstock, a, a preacher of some known, uh, has started doing something uh, every day. And what it is, is the proverb for the day. And he sends it out, and it's all focused in those first seven chapters. And I've enjoyed it. I look at it, and I go, yeah, spot on. Because it is wisdom from above. So that's what he's talking about. It's pure. Then it's peaceable. Well, that relates to me. I want peace. I want, I want to be settled within myself. How do I get settled within myself? I get my mind right. The inner man. I find that peace. Then he goes on to say, it's gentle. It's reasonable. Reasonable. Willing to yield. Not willing to compromise on matters of faith, of truth, not overlooking sin, but on things that really don't matter. I'm willing to yield. I'm reasonable. It doesn't always have to be my way. I want to I wanna bend. I want to acquiesce. Sundays, people come to me and say, 
Where do you want to go for lunch? I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. And you know what? It really doesn't. And even if you said, let's go to the California Chicken Cafe or whatever it's called, I would say, okay. And I would go and I would find something. And I would find something to eat. And I'd, sure, I would, as my nature is, I would tease you about eating foul food. I would do that. But I'm reasonable. It can't always be my way. In fact, a lot of times, I'm told that it's never my way. And why don't I want it that way? I don't. I don't care. I want to look to the interest of others. Even on something that's minor, as where do you want to go eat lunch? I want to be reasonable. Now, think about that in our relationships. Our relationships with our spouse. Tripping over one another. No, let it be your way. You as the husband, as the head of the family, it is my responsibility to see to it that my family is cared for. To provide for them. Emotionally, spiritually, physically. My needs are not all that important. But their needs are more important than mine. Even if it's simply a want to. That's reasonableness. And you go, well, that's, that's silly. And I think that's what he's talking about. Reasonable. Willing to yield. Full of mercy. Do you realize how much mercy God extended to me? I was not worthy of it. I was not worthy of it. I was in a position where I couldn't have done spiritually anything for myself. I was clearly at the mercy of God. And God said, I'll extend to you mercy. And now as I deal with others, I've got to be merciful to them. Jesus used a very good parable to explain it. And he explained it in the 18th chapter of Matthew about a man who was forgiven a debt. And he was so thankful. He couldn't repay the debt. And he was thankful for, for what he was forgiven. He then leaves and he's, he's elated. But he finds somebody who owes him a sum amount of money. And he goes, all right, you're going to pay me back everything. And if you don't, I'm going to get the law to exact every payment. I'll take everything you have. Everything. And then some. Well, the word got back to the master about this individual's untractableness with regards to mercy. And he called them back in and said, you know what? You're wicked. You're vile. I retract that mercy. You're going to go to prison until you pay every penny. Not only you, you and your family. And you'll be there until you can pay it back. Now think about that. If he's in prison, his family's in prison, how's he going to ever pay it back? He's going to be there in perpetuity. Mercy begets mercy. We need to be merciful to others. We need to be forgiving of others because we were forgiven. That's the wisdom from above. Good fruits. I'm doing what's right with my life. And I'm not doing it for vainglorious recognition. I don't do it to be lauded upon. I just do it because that's who I am as a Christian. Now, how does he end it? Unwavering, without hypocrisy. It's not an act. It's not an act. And it doesn't go high and low. It is a, it's a constant. 
It's who I am. Now, that's what I long for for me. It is an attitude that I want to hold on to. It is an attitude I want to embrace. And it goes back to the be attitudes that Jesus talked about back in Matthew 5. Now, when you break down Beatitudes, what does it say? Be, and then attitude. The mindset. Now, is that what Christ is driving at? No, I don't think so. But I'm playing with it a little bit. Because he is talking about attitudes. And humility. Mournfulness. Meekness. Motivated. Merciful. All of those are discussed in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Making a peace. Long-suffering. Longing for the Word of God. Having a spiritual appetite. See, that's the attitude of Christ. Longing. Reaching forward. So when Paul writes, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's quite an attitude. It's quite a mind. And so we embrace it. And we long for it. And we work and learn and apply in order to find it. So let me go back to what I started this afternoon. A change of perspective will bring you the answer you seek. I think that kind of sums up the lessons for today. We need to change our perspectives. We need to look at things a little bit differently. Because the answers that we seek, the answer that we long for, is a closer, intimate walk with the God of heaven. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Let me ever walk with thee. Some, some variations on that draw close to thee. But that's what we want. Well, the lesson is yours this afternoon. Uh, if you look at your clocks or your watches, however you decide to render time, you see that I paid you back some of the time when I ran over. So I'm keeping a running clock monitor in my brain. It is a mental Excel in my brain. And um, so I've made up five minutes. But we want the time to be well spent. And so trust that in our time today, it has caused you to look a little bit closer at yourself. I know it has for me. Even as I was preparing it, I thought, how does this apply to me? And so a lot of different ways. But if there's anyone who's subject to the invitation in any way, we'd invite you to come while we stand and sing. Oh.